Amen. I hope you uh been refreshed, all right, and excited and also challenged and encouraged, right, by the preaching. Right. Okay. I am certain that many of us here never expected that the book of Ruth had so much stuff in it. <coughs> And I don't know if you noticed so far, today we've only been in chapter 2. <laughs> All right. Of course, actually chapter 2 has quite a bit of stuff and that's why we had to park in there a bit more. All right. So, once again, we're going to open our Bibles and we're going to be in chapter 2. Okay. And let's read All right, verse 20 to verse 23. All right. So stand, and then we show tonight, Lord willing, what we're going to do is we're going to go from chapter 2 and blitz through chapter 3, all right, to build up tonight to a cliffhanger. And then tomorrow, we will finish the final episode, all right, chapter 4, okay? So that's what we're going to do, all right. So let's read this responsively. I'll begin with verse 20. Verse 20. Let me see. Yeah. Wait, wait, hang on. Hang on. I need to go back up a bit. <laughs> okay. Verse 19. I'll begin with verse 19. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where rottest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, This man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi, and sorry, go ahead. <laughs> and Ruth the Moabitess said, he said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter in law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out to these maidens, that they be not in any other field. Together, so she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother in law. Right? Let's pray. Father, thank you for. Uh, bringing us even uh, to this last evening here at the camp. Thank you for the reading of your word. And I pray, Lord, that during this, during this time of preaching, that you once again open up these very important, valuable truths to us from your word. Use me again as your instrument. Sanctify me. Cleanse me of all, right, on all unrighteousness. I am merely just a, an instrument, unworthy as I am, if not for the justification by the blood of Jesus Christ. Use me, Lord. Fill me with thy spirit. And then, Lord, I pray that uh, you open our eyes of understanding and through the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God, that you just impress these important truths. And, Lord, to, there may be someone here tonight that cannot see a way forward and cannot see how things will work out, that you will open their eyes and then to show thyself mighty, show that the hand of God is ever-present and is working even in the hearts and lives of your people. And Lord, I pray tonight that there may be decisions and things that we need to deal with. And Lord, that you will lead us, guide us into all truth. Take away all distractions and we just commit this time to you, Lord. And we ask this in Christ's name, pray. Amen. Please be seated. Now, <clears throat> We see, I want to see here very quickly, okay, to wrap up chapter 2, that a number of things that have happened, right, uh, Ruth, in taking that initial step out to do something, right, to do something based on what God has already provided uh, for His people through the law of God, through the law of Moses, right, through the law of concerning gleaning, and the Lord divinely directs Ruth right, to a field which so happened to belong to Boaz 
right? And she so happened to be allowed to glean there. And while she's doing that, then she so happened to meet him, Boaz, and who then discovers uh, some about her background, uh, her situation, and he learns something about her faithfulness, right? About her loyalty towards her mother-in-law, Naomi. That how, uh, even though in, in spite of that situation, uh, even, even though her prospects would have been better if she sought the opportunity to abandon Naomi and then just, uh, you know, she, it will enhance the chances of maybe finding a man. She took advantage of what God had laid out and designed as a way to provide for the poor and the needy and for the stranger. And God directs one puts together this puzzle one piece at a time. Boaz, in discovering her situation, he realizes he is a near kinsman right, to Elimelech, and he decides he will help in his own way right, to do things, and, and he works silently behind the scenes. He shows kindness to her in a way that she could not understand. And, uh, and all this to help without taking away the incentive to work. In our modern day uh, language, we have a term for this. We call this not welfare, but workfare. Helping people to help themselves. And he, as he assisted in all these, now she gathers what she has gleaned and she goes home. Right? So we come to verse 18. And when she arrives home, you notice Naomi's surprise. Right? She took it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she brought forth and gave to her what she had reserved after she was sufficed. So she set aside sufficient for herself and then she gave to her mother-in-law and her mother-in-law was surprised. Wow! All in one day's work and she brought back this much. So verse 19, she, her mother-in-law was curious. How is it possible? What happened here today? And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? Now, her mother-in-law, Naomi, was curious because she wasn't expecting to see Ruth bring back that much. Yes, she's going to go out to glean. She's, she's, okay, she has uh, dedicated herself to actually work to, to do this. Okay, Ruth had worked hard all day, hardly taking a break. But with, okay, by gleaning in Boaz's field, and then with the help that Boaz had provided silently, quietly, be secretly behind the scenes, okay, this has surprised her. It says, where hast thou gleaned today, and where rottest thou? Now notice, Naomi is beginning to see the invisible hand of God working. Up to that point, what she saw was the invisible hand of God working against her. This was a turn of events. Now she is recognizing what is happening. Alright? It said, Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. Dang dang. Light bulb comes on. Right? She returns back with a good amount of grain. And Naomi could see this was a blessing. What happened today? Right? What a blessing. You know, and she, she is very grateful. Okay? Where once she was unhappy, she was disgruntled, she was bitter against God, she was grateful. This whoever allowed Ruth to glean. Alright? Like I said, she's surprised by the amount that she brought back, probably because while the law provided for uh, those who were poor to glean, many, it's very likely that many plantation owners and all that are not very welcoming of this. Why should I allow you to glean my field? Right? You, you know, some may even see that you're, you're stealing from us. You know, and they would chase people away. But, so she was surprised by the amount she brought back. And said, whoever it is, right, has been very kind, very gracious, and she blesses him. Blessed, right, be he that did take notice of take knowledge of thee. Now, when 
Ruth mentions, okay, this is, his name is Boaz and he's the owner. Now, she recognizes the hand of the Lord in all these matters. She sees the divine coincidence of meeting Boaz. Okay? God had been working behind the scenes invisibly all this time without her realizing. This is the moment she wakes up. The light bulb comes on now. Right? She's recognizing this is not a coincidence. Ruth going out there, right? Of all the people in Bethlehem who own a field, how did Ruth end up in on Boaz's property? Right? And here was a reminder. This is like also a message, can you imagine, from the Lord to Naomi. Don't forget, you have a near kinsman. And his name is Boaz. Okay? I'm reminded of that how the Lord does send certain messages to people. Do you remember how... Um, Every once in a while, a leper will come to Jesus and Jesus will heal the leper completely of the leprosy. All right? Now, there's always the instruction to what? go show thyself to the priest. Why? Because only the priest can certify that this man is cured of leprosy. Now, here's the interesting thing. Throughout the Old Testament law, all right, in the book of Moses, I'm sorry, in the law of Moses, that was the procedure for how to recognize and certify that someone has been cured of leprosy even though there has been no cure. There was no cure until just the last 40 years or so. Okay, if you get leprosy, it's a death sentence. And every time he sends a leper to the temple to see the priest, can you see what's going on here? It's like a little message to the priest. Someone out there has the power of God to cure the incurable. That in the whole history, right, in the Old Testament, there's only been like, well, I think a very few cases, Naaman for what? Okay? Who's been, ever been cured? Everybody dies from this. Can you imagine God preparing the priest in the temple, sending a very subtle message to someone out there with this amazing power of God? And in all these hundreds right, of years, God laid a procedure to recognize and to certify someone free of leprosy. Nobody has ever had to use this until now. God sends a message. Here, there's a little subtle message here saying, I am still on the throne of your life. I am still in control. And I can direct somebody in this town to the right place to meet the right person. Okay? There's a near kinsman. Now, in doing so, we see here that she recognized the hand of the Lord in the situation. All right? there's, a, there's a recognition of God's hand in the events. Okay? All this time, in her bitterness and her uh, anger against God, she had been blinded to what God has been doing. Right? She was blind to the fact that there was someone who was a great blessing to her in the midst of her deepest despair. Ruth had always been there with her. Right? God has been merciful and kind. That's why she says, Blessed be the He of the Lord who had not left off His kindness to the living and the dead. Right? This verse 20. She recognized that God is able to provide for the living and the dead. All right? He had provided for two poor widows. And here was the change. Naomi has come back. Okay? In declaring this in verse 20, she's declaring now, she blesses God where once she says, you know what? He took everything away from me. Slowly, Right? Here, one way of looking at this is the recovery of a saint. Okay? We will go through very deep despair and in the valleys at some point of our life. But 
there can also be a recovery, especially when you know our eyes are no longer on us and on, on our situation, but on what the Lord is doing. Right? She's finally seeing this. And that's why she's able to declare, Blessed be he of the Lord, be he of the Lord. Right? Referring to boys who had not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. Now, why, why did she say that? Because Boaz had showed kindness right, in, the, in honor of her dead husband and her two sons, but also to the living, the survivors. And Naomi is very clear. Right? She declares, he's a relative. Naomi said to her, the man is, of, is near of kin unto us and one of our next kinsmen. Now, it's very clear she knew, she knew that. She knew who Boaz was. For whatever reason, she did not go to him. Maybe when she came back, she was ashamed. Okay? Sometimes we are ashamed to turn to a relative for help because uh, in our need, in our poverty, we may be afraid of being despised. Okay? Maybe she's embarrassed to seek help and then... Uh, you know, to be rejected and to come back empty-handed. Sometimes what happens uh, for some of us here is that we, are, we don't want to come back to church. We don't want to come back to the Lord. Why We feel that I need to do something to clean up my life and all that first before I can come back. Now, here in this act of mercy and grace, what Naomi now is seeing is, wait, Boaz has shown kindness And there is an indication or hint there that he's willing to help. She recognizes this, this is now confirmation. It's no longer coincidence. So she tells, all right, now notice verse 21. And Ruth the Moabite said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. Boaz didn't just ask her to come back. He says, you stay here until the whole harvest is over. Okay? Just come and keep coming back. You don't have to waste time searching around for a place that will have you, that will welcome you. You are always welcome here. Just keep coming back. Don't worry about it. I will take care of things. Now, Naomi, so we see Naomi's realization to continue in the current circumstance. Verse 22, And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. Right? You keep going back to the same place, go back, all right, as Boaz had requested, don't worry, don't go to any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz, verse 23, to glean until the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So you see here that um, she just kept going and just very quick less, uh, points here is where God has begun to turn the situation around, where the Lord has started to bring about that blessing. Don't be in a hurry to move on to better pastures. Stay where you are. All right? Continue to grow. Continue to be there until the Lord should move you to the next step. Okay? Here she has found that this place, that if they will go to the field of Boaz, that God will provide a way for them. But you know sometimes... In our covetousness, where God has been providing and is giving us a way to make, make ends meet and to make a living and, and to take care of the needs, whatever, we are looking at, I'm looking for bigger fish to fry. I'm looking for something more. But Naomi's advice was this this is the place where God is working, this is the place where God has been blessing. So, what did she tell Ruth? Stay. Okay. This may sound familiar because some of you may be in that situation right now. Whatever circumstances the Lord has led you to where you are today. Okay? 
And because you are here right now in Siem Reap, right, anchored in this church, there has been great blessing, there has been growth. Right? We've prospered spiritually as a result. Just as Ruth and Naomi have now are prospering materially, right? Uh, as God is providing for them there. I won't be surprised, some of you, when you came up here, it was because of a better job, that's all. But over time, you started to realize God brought you here for a bigger purpose than that. Right? And so be careful not to seek something else or to stay where we are until the Lord should indicate otherwise. Okay? And Naomi recognized that, that the hand of the Lord has been working all this time. Okay? Now, realize this, even for someone as bitter as her in her situation, this, all this unexpected kindness is opening her eyes. Right? To see the situation is not as bad as we think. And God is more than able to provide even through this means, just gleaning. Pick, think about this. This is just surviving on leftovers. How many of you want to depend on your next few meals on leftovers? But the Lord is showing He is more than able to help. And through a series of unexpected coincidences, all the pieces of the puzzle are coming together and she recognizes he's a near kinsman. All right, now, at this point, Naomi is realizing, you know what, there is a way out. There is a solution. There is a way forward where previously she did not. Right? Remember she told uh, Oprah and, and uh, Ruth, right? she has no more sons in her womb. Right? There's no way to provide a son or uh, someone that uh, Ruth can marry. Right? So she's telling Ruth, you are wasting your time. Right? You can have a better future without me. Go. And now she's realizing, okay, not only was there the law of gleaning, there is the law of the kinsman redeemer that God had put in place by his divine will and design and his divine wisdom that there is a way to solve this problem. And you see, sometimes we conclude there is no way forward, there's no solution, we cannot solve this, all right, there is, this is impossible, why? Because of our limited knowledge. But do you realize something? God is not limited by your ignorance. And very often the dead end, the dead end exists simply because we do not, we have not searched out the Word of God for answers. And what answers we formulate are based on what little we know. Okay? And so this was a reminder to Ruth, or right, sorry, to Naomi, that, you know what, there is a way. And so, when you come to chapter 3, I want to see here that Ruth is now, okay, Ruth and Naomi are now able to rest in the Lord. Okay? We talk about the plan. Alright? Now, you'll see here at the beginning of verse 1 that Naomi is now shifting from her focus on herself to Ruth and others. All right? She had been feeling sorry for herself. She has been miserable. She has been bitter. Now, her, she shifts her focus away from her own affliction to Ruth. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, this shall I not seek rest for who? For thee. That it may be well with thee. You see, all this time, Ruth had been taking care of Naomi's welfare, right? been providing for her. Now, she has been very selfless, working very hard, right? without a care for how this will affect her and all that. You know, even in, uh, in the Song of Solomon, the, the w young woman out there in the field, she said, you know, oh, why would you pick me as a bride and all that? She said, look, my, my, I'm so black, I'm so dark, my complexion. Why? Because I've been working out in the sun. Okay, but here now, because of this selflessness, because of this sacrifice, it was infectious and it caught on with Naomi. You see that? You see, because kindness catches on. And you could have someone who is so discouraged, so 
focus on themselves that they are utterly totally selfish but you can it can change and transform them that love and that kindness and now she's thinking about Ruth's welfare Naomi notices that observes this that Boaz is a near kinsman and that he might be open to the prospect of marriage okay think about this what was the other coincidence not just that Boaz is a near kinsman all right not just that he is a relative of Elimelech. Don't forget one more thing. Boaz is single. He's not married. He's single and he's available. <laughs> okay? He's single and he's available. And now, so her question was this. Is this, you know, shall I not seek rest for thee? Now, Naomi is saying, Ruth, I'm going to do something. Okay, for your good, for to help you. All right, so that it will be well with thee. And she says, verse two, it says, "And now it's not boys of our kindred. So with whose maidens thou was, right? This, you've been working with his uh, workers, those maidens. Now it says, okay, but there is a window of opportunity. Why? It says, behold." He went over Bali tonight in the trashing floor. Now, when you look at the last verse of chapter 2, it tells us that Ruth, so she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother in law. Right? Time has gone by. Ruth has been going back over. Every, day after day gleaning gleaning gathering all this grain right but the harvest is about to end this time all this time maybe from day to day she will bump into boys boys will say hello they exchange kind words right he's been helpful to her he's been very kind to her this coming and going this meeting whoever it went through the barley harvest the barley harvest was over. Then the, what was it? The wheat harvest came. Think about this. But they are not going to see each other again for some time. It's now or never. It is now time to make a move. <laughs> some of you are laughing because you are expecting certain people to make a move. <laughs> And here, it was now time to do something. All right? And Naomi, being the older one, she, in her wisdom, she points out, you have a limited window tonight. Boaz is going to winnow the barley tonight in the threshing floor. All right? She, what was she saying in verse 2? Boaz is a near relative, and he is unmarried. He is available and because of that he can take on the role of the kinsman redeemer to redeem Malon's land that was sold why how would this work right the kinsman redeemer has to be a near relative okay not only a near relative he must be available and then he must be willing willing to do this what will happen he will marry Ruth Whoever is the kinsman redeemer will marry Ruth, right? They will have children and raise up those children in Ruth's husband's name. Ex right? The one that was departed. Why? To make sure that there is an inheritance and the family name is not extinguished. It will carry on. Okay? The inheritance will go to Ruth's children also as a result. And here... We're coming to the end of the barley harvest. If they miss this, there's no more chance to meet Boaz and to talk to him. Okay? Don't wait till it's time for you to leave Siem Reap to say what you really need to say. Hmm? I don't know who, okay? I'm just looking around. I don't know who. And 
Here, there, there is a point where, you see, Naomi recognizes if you don't take that, that opportunity, that window is open, if you don't use it, it is gone. Oh, by the way, the same thing, you notice when the Lord Jesus Christ talked about the harvest, there is a window. If we don't harvest, the opportunity to win those souls, it's gone. There is a limited opportunity. That window can close. That's why during the harvest time, it's very serious business. You cannot fool around. You cannot take your time. You have to work fast. You waited all for months or whatever until for the harvest to come. Okay? And regardless of the type of harvest, the things, if it's a fruit harvest, you wait a little bit longer, everything starts dropping and it's used, it cannot be used. It cannot be sold. Here, Ruth was told now to prepare herself and then go see Boaz and to present herself to indicate her willingness to be married to him. Alright? Look at Naomi's instructions. Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee. Alright? And put thy raiment upon thee and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. Now, here's what's going to happen. This is the harvest night. There will be a celebration and after the celebration, now the owner here will sleep on the, okay, on the on the threshing floor, all right. He will personally thresh all this, all right. He will, he will watch over this, and there will be the great joy of knowing, you know, what, this is the fruit and reward of all their labor. Okay, they will eat, they will feast, and then after that, he will sleep there, personally to make sure that you know he saves God all this. And what Naomi is telling Ruth is this: go there and talk to him. I don't need to state the obvious here. You know, for, for those who are single, sometimes it's really down to this. There is a time to say something, say it. Okay? Don't waste time. Because that opportunity, that time may not come again. All right? She used to wait until the festivities are over. Everyone was done eating and drinking. All right? Most of them, were, people were gone to sleep. Right, the Lord of the harvest will sleep at the threshing floor to guard the crop. Right, now, Ruth was told to take note of where Boaz is sleeping right, and then quickly slip over there. And the idea was to uncover the blanket from his feet and lay at his feet. Now, this was symbolic of something. Right, this is nothing uh, suggestive or improper, but there was, it was a symbolic gesture that she was willing to come under okay, submission under him and to come under his care and protection Right, as the husband. Alright, so what happens now? This was a signal and symbol to him to fulfill his duty all right, as the kinsman redeemer. Now, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5 and 6. Alright, Deuteronomy chapter 25. Look at verse 5 and 6. It says, If brethren do dwell together and one of them die and have no child. You see that? The wife of the dead shall not marry without, on, uh, with, shall not marry without unto a stranger. Now, words, you don't marry out unto somebody else, a stranger. It says, Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to, take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. Right? The family name will be preserved on. Now, you know, we live now in a modern age where um, there are many who are grown up, maybe even older than me in their 60s. And guess what? All the siblings have decided that they were not, mar they were not going to marry and not going to have children. You know, there are, I know of families where because of those decisions, life decisions, that entire family line will disappear in a few more years. 
Because there is no one to carry on the family name. Now here, Ruth was going to go to okay, Boaz to propose to him that he will, should take on that responsibility. To remind him uh, that as under the law of Moses, that was his responsibility to undertake. Now, when you look at verse 5, I want to see here that she was ready to obey God's plan as it was laid out in the word. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Okay? Now think about this. She's going to do this now. Um, this afternoon we had some a bunch of questions on that. Now, what do you see here? You don't see this while well, they got to know each other, they went out, they had dinner, right? they got to spend time with each other, all that. Uh, no. All they were going to do is they're going to follow God's plan. It's very simple. God's plan, God's design. Now that the Lord had provided a way. Now, you know from the things that have happened in chapter 2 that there were all sorts of indications and hints that there was mutual interest. Okay? In particular, for Boaz. You see how he quietly helps her here and there. He's being very nice, exceptionally nice to her. And ladies, when someone is being especially nice and kind and helpful to you, it's a hint. <laughs> Someone's shaking her head. Okay? Now, there are things that are also going on now. Remember, Boaz is not young. Okay? This is not an easy thing. Also, think about this. Boaz is not young. He probably is at the point where he, in his age, he probably thinks, nah, it's never going to happen. I'm past that. All right? Past expiry date. As a man. He may be rich. All right? But ladies, a lot of ladies are, they want rich, young, and handsome. <laughs> okay? He's not young. We don't have any other description about how he looks. Okay? For Ruth, she's a Moabitess. Okay? How many men in Israel are willing to consider? In fact, there is no provision for that except under the kinsman redeemer law. Okay, normal marriage would be out of the question. Okay, to marry a Moabitess, not under the law, law of Moses, but she has come to trust in the God of Israel. She is also, was married to a man of Israel. And now what happens? There is another way. You see what I'm saying here? There is another way through the law concerning the kinsman redeemer. Now the kinsman redeemer law is important because it actually, there is a picture also of the redemption through Jesus Christ. Right? Notice that Christ has to be a near kinsman to us. He cannot just be uh, God in spirit form. He had to be born as a man, as a human just like us, near relative. Okay? He has to be willing. He voluntarily left his throne and all his glory to be born in the form of a man, right? in the form of a servant, the scriptures tells us, and then to suffer the death on the cross for our sake, to buy us out because we were in slavery and in bondage to sin right? as under the law. And the Lord Jesus Christ comes in as our kinsman redeemer to do that, to redeem us as we're under the law so that we might be made free. Okay? And to carry now that inheritance and that name. Okay? That's why as, for as many as received him, right? John chapter 1, gave he power to become the sons of God. It doesn't say children. The modern translations say children of God. The King James Bible says the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Why? Because the sons carry the family name, the inheritance. Right? They carry, they are given the authority and the right to rule. 
because we will rule together with Christ right and he doesn't just pick the boys or the guys it's all the women also as many who are saved right as many as have received him he said gave he power to become the sons of God every one of the ladies who are saved you know what you will have the full right of inheritance as a son you see the parallels now here what's going to happen is this Naomi tells her alright go wash thyself now she's come back okay Ruth comes back from work how does she smell hmm sweaty alright she smells of that and she says so she says what go wash thyself anoint thee so now she puts on some ointment and perfume and she smells nice also ladies right? smells nice and then says, and she tells her what dress up and put thy raiment upon thee okay he's asking her to put on by implication I think she's asking her to put on something nice not just working clothes alright and, and get thee down to the floor all right, and so she's going to hide there and wait for the right moment. Timing is important. <laughs> okay, verse five. She tells Naomi all that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Okay, so you see here the plan. Next, we're going to see the proposal. Verse six, and she went down onto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. Alright, verse 5 she says her intention was clear whatever you tell me I will do verse 6 it confirms whatever she was asked to do she did that alright she followed the instructions given to her and then now we see the meeting with Ruth and Boaz alright Boaz wakes up in the middle of the night and he was shocked that there was a stranger there verse 7 and when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn Okay, so there's also a pile of corn over there, all right, and he was lying there, and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. Okay, so she puts herself down under his skirt, she lifts part of that skirt, and then she, okay, and she laid herself down there. And now he didn't notice that he had gone there to lie down, all right, to rest. But says, and it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid. Right, somewhere around midnight, he moves, he stirs, whatever, and he notices, he he touches her, and like, who's there? Right, and he turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. Now it's dark; he doesn't know who it is. He, all he notices is that there's a woman there. What? Why is she doing that? Okay. Now she waited for the right timing and the moment, and the opportunity, the moment. Naomi recognized this was the timing. Why? Because all this time. Now, she's older and more experienced than Ruth. Okay? And she can smell it. She knows something is going on here. Because all the little things that Boaz has been doing is showing that he's interested. Okay, he's interested. But like many men, they're also afraid. Mm, they're afraid. <laughs> and so what's going to happen? Naomi is sitting there and it's like, this girl and this guy, it will be another five years before something happens. And so she tells Ruth, you know, it's time to do something to break this deadlock. Okay? They're stuck there. To do anything else would seem to would come across as improper. And so now Naomi decides she's gonna help Ruth and boys along. 
They just need a little nudge. Mm. All right. And so Boaz wakes up and says, like, Why is there a woman here? Okay. Now, like I said, things had to be something had to be done to move things forward. Now, as I mentioned, it may be po- it's possible, highly possible that because of his age, now Boaz never had in any, any such intentions because he's just thinking, why would someone like her be interested in him? Right? At his age. Right? So he had probably given up all hopes already for a long time. Right? And in particular, a woman like Ruth, loyal, devoted, hardworking. Guys, you, you, you see that? Sometimes, what, what bothers us, what, what really hurts inside is, it's too good to be true. I dare not imagine a future with someone like her. Why would she ever choose someone like me? Hmm? I wonder how many husbands today you recognize that's that's exactly how it is in your situation. Right? That even after the wedding, you know, I am the so called luckiest man alive because she chose me, and there is no logical reason why she would do that. To be with her, and she chose me. God has singled me out for a special blessing. I do not deserve that. And Boaz looks at a woman like Ruth, and you know, I will not dare dream that this was possible. Can you see why it may be difficult for him to make the next move? And that sometimes, men in this situation, despite that he is wealthy, he may have been turned down many times. Why go through it one more time? Do some of you recognize yourselves in that situation? I hope you do. All right, and so we need some. Encouragement and nudging. Now, listen, ladies, some of you, you console yourself. You, you sit there and say, well, I'm waiting for Boaz to come into my life. But can you see in the text here that the ball is in her court? That unless she did something, nothing is going to happen. Naomi sent Ruth out there to knock some sense into Boaz's head. <laughs> right? Right, because Boaz already initiated the friendship. There's kindness and consideration. There was a lot of mutual civility and all that. But here, something needed to be done. I recognize, right? The Bible tells us that whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing. The man needs to do the finding. But here, again, a man like in Boaz's situation may have already figured out, again, by our own reasoning, that something like this is simply not possible. You get what I'm saying here? In our own reasoning, when we look at the situation, we look at our circumstances and we conclude, how can this possibly happen? It's not going to happen. So don't even set myself up for a disappointment. I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to break my heart again. Some guys here, you recognize, you recognize this, maybe it's like, well, I don't want to risk having my heart ripped. I'm just happy to care for her and love her from a distance. Hmm? Been there? Done that? Huh? And what happens now? (laughs) As long as I can just continue to say hi and you know, we exchange pleasantries, whatever, that's it. You know, this is just too much to dream for. I learned the, there was a term in Japanese, they call it, okay, they describe it as a flower on a mountain top. Unreachable. So don't even dream about it. 
no man can attain to that. You set yourself up for disappointment. So, all right, now, they're not dating or whatever, but you do see here that there is a, some form of a very complex tennis match going on. And the ball is going back and forth and back and forth, but it's not really going anywhere. And now something has to be done. And so Ruth identifies herself to Boaz. This is dark. He only knows that there is a woman there. All right? And she requests for him to marry her as what? The kinsman redeemer. Verse 9 it says, And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Now notice what she says Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid. For thou art a near kinsman. Now this was the statement that now will push things beyond this very steady, very comfortable relationship and friendship, whatever. This is the moment of decision. She tells him, I am your near kinsman. Right, you are a new near kinsman. And then she said, Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaiden. Why? She's saying, I am prepared, I am willing to come under your protection, right? Come under your provision as your wife. Okay? As under the kinsman redeemer law. He's asking, she's asking him now. Okay? She says. I'm willing to consider this if you are. Marry me. <laughs> it's interesting because I see an example here where the woman is the one that actually make, makes the move. I like that. <laughs> hmm? This was the moment Boaz has been waiting for. All right, this young beautiful woman that he previously thought there's no way it's unattainable an old guy like me you know a young woman like her all right with all her wonderful qualities and her beauty and and also her character all right it was too much to ask for it was impossible and now she is there at his feet asking him to marry her wow Okay. She requested for him to spread his skirt because this was a request to come under his care as a wife. Okay, we read Deuteronomy chapter 25 already, verse 5 and 6. Right? There was a provision there in the law of Moses. Okay, that the uh, brother, or here in this case, I think would be also a going out from there, I think cousins and all that, that they can do this so that the name will never be lost or extinguished. Now the law also covered the sale of land and its redemption. Now Leviticus 25 verse 25 to 28 says this, If thy brother be waxen poor and has sold away some of his possession. Right? Now Malon would have sold away that land when they went over to Moab. It says, And if thy any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his, bro which his brother sold. Okay? So although it was sold, it can be bought back. Okay. And if the man have none to redeem it and himself is able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the land thereof and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may re return unto his possession. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that have bought it until the, notice, the year of Jubilee. 50 years. What happens? In that, after that, it is actually returned. Okay? You never permanently lose it. All right? And in the Jubilee, it shall go out and he shall return unto his possession. All right? So kinsman, the next kin can redeem it. All right? The original owner, if the original owner cannot pay the full redemption price, right? they calculate the percentage until the next Jubilee and they pay only the percentage based on the timing, what, how much time is left. Okay? Now, if they wait until the 50 years, the land will revert back in its ownership. Okay? Why? Because God laid down a system where such that this prevents those who are greedy from grabbing more and more land and accumulating it or exploiting it under 
difficult circumstances. Imagine if there was a famine and then someone in Cambodia went buying up all the available land to monopolize that. Okay? And so now, so Ruth presents herself that both of them were eligible. Okay? As under the law of God, and she's telling basically the simple message here is this Boys, do the right thing. Okay? Some of you guys need to be very prayerful and pluck up the courage and do the right thing and ask whoever she is instead of just making her wait. I don't know who you are, okay? Now, here was the proposal, but there was a problem. Right? Look at verse 10. Boaz praises her for being godly and morally upright. Okay? He's full of praises for her. Now, the the husband and wife session just now, we, we spent some time also listing out some of the things that uh, our spouses are worthy of praise for. Why? Because it's important, I think, for as both husband and wife to be able to recognize these things. Okay? I think it was, the, uh, I can't remember, was it last, uh, last year? Okay? We had, uh, there was one worker, this was in Myanmar, and then what happened was, uh, as we sat down, we talked, and this this man was always complaining about his wife. If he describes his wife, one of the first things he says, she's fat. <laughs> and I was like, okay, can you please name three things that you like about your wife? <laughs> it took 15 minutes. He couldn't say anything. I was like, what is, I said, do you see what is wrong with you? All, right, all you can do is complain about her. You can't say anything nice. You, you don't even see or uh, can appreciate something nice about her. Something's wrong with that. Here, he praises her. He says, and he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. Okay, once again, that age gap is there. He's very clear about that. He said, For thou hast showed more kindness in the letter than at, at, at the letter and then at the beginning. All right? This is, you are more kind to me now than when we first met. And she's probably asked, thinking, huh? How so? Notice. It says, in so much as thou followest not young men, whether rich, whether poor or rich. All right. Boaz blessed the Lord for that he has come to know such a wonderful woman like Ruth. Right? He calls her daughter because he is much older than her. But you notice something? He praises her for her integrity and her moral uprightness. Why? She's young. She's available. She's attractive. And what he said here was this. You could have picked any young guy, whether rich or poor, She could have had a pick of the best of the men out there. And she did not. Wow. See that? All right, because many times one of the biggest temptations and distractions will be this. If, if a lady, a woman is blessed with physical looks, all right, what happens? It always attracts a lot of attention from the guys. Those especially who are wealthy have the confidence knowing that they can have their pick of anybody they wanted. Okay? Here, she's young, attractive. She could pick any young guy. Okay? Whether for money or whether for love. Okay? Whether rich or poor. She can follow her passion or she can follow the money. Whichever case... She can do that. And so he acknowledges she has many opportunities. And yet, he says here, in coming to him like that, he acknowledges she was being very, very kind and gracious to him. Oh, 
Why? Because she wanted to obey the Lord and His provision through the kinsman redeemer law, even though she would end up with an old guy like him. Wow. Think about this again. From Boaz, can you see from Boaz's perspective, this is too good to be true. Right? Here's this young woman who can easily end up with any young man rather than someone like him. Right? Including a rich young guy. And said she comes to him, humbly requests that he would be the kinsman redeemer. Right? And to carry on that family name. And so he praises her. Okay? Now, I wonder how many of us are that our eyes are open we're discerning enough that we can see that in this woman or this person not just that we like her because she's sweet and cute and pretty or whatever but there's more than that there are things that are worthy of praise okay it was interesting that the husbands actually came up with quite a long list of things to praise about their wives which was good okay I thought they might be in trouble actually but they actually had a quite a long list I don't know maybe they came a long list to to score points there I'm not sure okay but there was a fairly long list and I was uh, okay and it was a it was interesting surprise now but there was a problem okay there was a problem because what happens now He tells her, okay, look at verse 11 now. I will note this, right? Men, resolve to be the one to offer the assurance, especially in the relationship. He tells her, and now my daughter, fear not. Right? He is being decisive. Right? He's showing his resolve. He says, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. <coughs> okay? Now he's a man of faith. He encourages Ruth to face the challenge here with faith. Alright? Faith to do what. It, but he says, trust me, I'm going to do what is necessary. I'm going to do what needs to be done. Alright? And everyone knows you're a virtuous woman. Again, notice how he praises her. We forget, you know, by the way, men, we forget this after a number of years of marriage and we get so used to things. Nothing is new anymore. And we, we stop saying these things. And Boaz, even though he's not a married man, all right, he has no experience in marriage, and, but you notice he, he tells it like it is. He recognizes this and he tells her, praises her. Now, but there is a hitch, all right? Because look at the next verse. He remember he resolves that I'm going to do what is necessary. All right, I'm going to do whatever it takes. But verse twelve he says, but there is a problem. There is a problem. Now he gives them he gives her a new piece of information. This is, and now it is true that I am near thy. I am thy near kinsman. How be it? There is a kinsman nearer than I. He says, yes, I'm a near kinsman, but I'm not the closest relative. There's somebody else. Alright? Someone else who is closer to Ruth's hus ex-husband. Alright? And he has the first right to redeem her. Not boys. Now, think about Think about this. I wonder how many of, at this point, how many of us, what, how will we react? We have come so close. Your dreams are just about to materialize and then, why did this thing happen? Why is there somebody else? What is this sick joke? God, 
now will cruelly snatch this thing away from us. Why? Because there is a nearer kinsman. Which means he will be the first one. If Ruth offers herself, that man must be the one to either say yes or no. If he says yes, what will happen? He marries her, not Boaz. Okay? But realize this, Boaz is a man who will always do the right thing. But here, here let, let, let me try to picture this. Here's what's at stake, right? If they obey the Lord and follow the law, what happens? There is a chance that Boaz and Ruth will never be together. Why? If the other kinsman says, okay, I will redeem this, I will marry her. Okay? Picture this. In obeying the Lord and following His plan, they will lose each other forever. That's the risk. Okay? The only way that they will be able to be together. Alright, and remember, both have the same intentions, both okay, are willing to commit their lives to each other for the you know, for the rest okay, commit themselves to each other for the rest of their lives. Why must this thing now come in between? If this is God's plan, why must this thing happen? Why is there an obstacle? You see what I'm saying? Here? The temptation before them will be this. What if we just keep quiet and we just go ahead? Who's going to know? By the time they're married, it's too late. No one can do anything about it. Let's just take things into our own hands. You see the temptation is there? All right? Because here's the thing. If they break outside of God's plan, if they take things into their own hands, if they do their own thing, what happens now? Okay? Because if they follow God's plan, what will happen? There is a danger they never get what they want. Okay? Boaz will lose her forever. So what's he going to do? Okay, I want us to see here that they both decide they must trust the Lord no matter what. No matter what. That they are going to trust Him even when the situation looks impossible. Okay, here is the, the major war and battle that will go on internally, which is, there, I don't see how this is going to work out. And what a cruel trick. Right? God finally works everything and then they, the two of them have expressed their mutual interest right? and that they desire to be, be together. And now this obstacle. Okay? Many of us, to be honest, when put in this situation, we will be tempted to take things into our own hands. Right? We, why? Because what is at stake is this. If I follow God, my happiness is at stake. What will you do? Boaz is a man who is committed to always doing right. Look at the proper solution. He tells her, tarry this night, verse 13, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee. As the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. Now, so what happens now? If you look at this, there, there is, uh, okay, so they are faced with the temptation, right? Can they take control of the situation, take things into their own hands, and then, you know, just forget it. Don't let the, as long as you don't let the other kinsmen know, all right? Just go ahead, finish this thing. By the time everyone finds out, it's too late. There's no difference from just eloping and then just getting married anyway. All right? Oh, there's this problem. Uh, you know, there's this hitch with the parents. The parents don't approve of the marriage or whatever. Never mind, we're just going to go make a, make a trip. When we come back as husband and wife, what are they going to do? They can't do anything. Now, he tells her, okay, Terry, this night, remain here 
And in the morning, okay, what we're going to do is this. Let this man, this other nearer kinsman, all right, perform the kinsman part. If he will do it, then let him do it. If he will not, he says, I will do it. Now, what, what, what is Boaz also saying? We're going to let, we're going to trust the Lord to work this thing out. And men, I think we need to be that kind of men. Okay? The intention is clear, the goal is there. But many times we feel that we have to do something to make it happen. When here, the choice was this do we do it God's way? And there looks like there is a risk. Are we going to trust him or are we going to take things to our own hands? Boaz, notice he takes up that leadership. Right? And he says, we're going to do it God's way. Even if we don't know how this will work out. Okay? We're going to submit to that because that is the right way. The near kinsman, if he agrees to it, then he's telling, telling Ruth, marry him. If God wants us to be, get, to be together, he will decline and don't worry, I will be the one to take this thing up. Okay? We're going to have to let the Lord resolve this. Now, the bottom line message was very clear to Ruth was what? Stay calm, keep trusting the Lord. All right? Don't fret. Now this reminds me actually of something that actually happened some years ago. I think about 12 years back. This was among the Hmong refugees. A church was started in a ref refugee camp. All right, about, I think there was about 6,000 or, 6, or more people in the north of Thailand on a refugee camp. Now, a Baptist church, was independent Baptist church was started inside. At the peak, I think they had about 2,000 members. Okay, now these are all very poor refugees. They don't have money. There was a Bible institute and men were being trained and young ladies also being trained for the ministry. Now, in particular, I remember one couple because they were very young, okay, very sweet girl. And this man, very earnest, and he is a young preacher boy. Now, she comes up to him one day and she says, we have an urgent problem. This is my father is going to take our family and go, they're going to sneak out of the refugee camp and they're going to go to Bangkok and they're going to present we're going to present ourselves to the United Nations to get refugee status if that happens we will never see each other again this young man said you go with your father he said but, but come on he says don't you understand we will never be together we love each other we want to spend the rest of our lives together we want to be married all right he says, how can you just send me away? He says, it is right for you to follow your father. You go. He said, no, this is not happening. Now, the custom, okay, among the people, now I'm not talking about among the, in the, among the churches, the Christians there, but among the people was this. The way that the two people get together and, and come together for marriage is that the young man, together with his friends, will go over and kidnap the girl bring her to his house to stay the night, alright? They, they, they don't do anything, but they just bring her to her, his house to stay the night. And the next morning, he will go and negotiate with the father. Okay, and that's how they, that was the customary way. So, what she told him was this, you can't send me like that to my father, okay? Tonight, I'm going to come over, I'm, I'm going to force myself to stay over in your house. Okay, so the message was clear. We're going to force the situation. There will have to be a marriage negotiation. He said, if you do that, we are done. Okay? It's over between us. Why? Here was a young man who was determined, whatever we do, I want to honor the Lord. Including, okay, in marriage. And if we cannot do it the right way, it says, it's no way. You know what happened? 
she went back home. That night, her father changed her mind. He changed his mind. And then later on, they had a proper marriage. One that was honorable, honorable to, okay, that, that honors God, was honorable in the sight of everyone else. But you see that the urgency sometimes can force us to take things into our own hands. Right? And Boaz stays very calm. He tells her, no, we keep trusting the Lord even when the outcome looks bad. Remember, that was the thing, right? When the situation looked bad, what happened to Naomi and her family? They left. They went to Moab. They lost everything in the process. Okay? God is able to work things out if we trust Him. What did the psalmist say in Psalm 37? It says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. What do we do? You delight yourself in the Lord. Right? Uh, fix and focus on what is right and what will please him, what will honor him. What will he do? He will give thee the desires of thy heart. Now what does that mean? God will put the right desires into your heart. Okay? He's not give you what you want, but He's going to put the right desires. And sometimes that means changing your heart. Okay? Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him. And notice, He shall bring it to pass. Trust also in Him. Commit thy way. Okay? Now, Boaz and Ruth must commit their way to the Lord. If they take their own way, what happens? It is going to be the way of destruction. There is a way that seems around to men, but... What happens? There are other ways of destruction. All right, here again, the the sin of man was what? All we like sheep have gone astray. We've gone every man his own way. Where you and I are always going to be tempted with our own way. All right, it, it'll see what is right, what is right in our own eyes, and then try to figure it out. But listen, God doesn't need our help. He needs our submission. He needs our obedience. All right, rest in the Lord. Notice verse 7. And wait patiently for Him. There is a, a right timing. There is the right time. Fret not, you see? Because, fret not thyself because of Him who prospereth in His way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. So he tells her, wait, all right? Tarry until the morning. We're going to do this the right way. So they wait until the morning. And then what happens? He now takes also the precaution. Verse 14, And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. So she waits until the morning, right? But before it is bright enough to be able to recognize someone, she departs. Now, and he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. All right? He wants to avoid the appearance of evil. Right, First Thessalonians 5.22 tells us, abstain from all appearance of evil. It doesn't want to be, okay, allow her to be seen. Okay, a woman suddenly, quietly, secretly coming out from this place where they knew Boaz is going to be there. Right? That nothing should look improper. So what does he do? Not only was there a precaution, but the provision for Ruth's family, because verse 15, also he said, bring the veil that thou hast upon thee and hold it. All right? And when she held it, right, she held her veil open and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on, on her and she went into the city. Now, this was a substantial amount of grain and here was enough supply for Ruth and for Naomi. In carrying this, Think of this also, that the amount of grain that she's going to carry back is also a message to the future mother-in-law. That he is not only going to provide for Ruth, but for the mother-in-law. Okay? Listen, I know we can stand here and uh, we talk about marriage, however, we can make a lot of mother-in-law jokes, but uh, you notice something, you know, boys as a man, he is respectful of his mother-in-law, all right? 
And he wants her to know this. Okay? She is not forgotten. This is a large load. Now she's going to carry this. At the same time, there will be no suggestion that anything improper happened. Right, she returns home while it's still dark, verse 16. And she came to her mother-in-law and she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. Right? Note this. Boaz shows his care and concern for Naomi. Verse 17, and she said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. You do realize that when we marry some someone, that we marry into another family also, and whether you like it or not, you gain a father in law and a mother in law. Okay? And here Boaz makes this very gracious gesture and to show okay, he tells Ruth, Don't go back home empty. Bring this to okay, your mother in law. Right? And the message was received. Okay, Naomi received the message loud and clear. She understands Boaz and his intentions. Look at what she says here now. Okay, there's patience in waiting that's required now. Verse 18 Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. Okay, wait. Wait, and let's see how this thing plays out. Why? She says this is not about Boaz. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. Now, in this sense, here's the thing. True love is prepared to wait for God's plan. Okay? For God to work this thing out. Even when we have no idea how it's going to work out. Because why? Here is a very major hitch in the plan. There is another man. If The moment he says yes, all right, now what are the chances of that? Here's, the, here's this kins, near kinsman. He's going to see Ruth and whoo. You mean I get her to, she gets to be my wife also? While I redeem the land, all that? Okay. And Ruth is, but, 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 I don't even know who this guy is. I don't want to marry this guy. All right, I want boys. And boys is like, after coming to realize that what he thought was impossible is now within his grasp. What happens? He's going to lose her. Most of us would do something to guarantee that we get what we want. And here, notice, Naomi says, this man, the, for the man will not be in rest until he finish, have finished the thing this day. All right? True love, yes, is prepared to wait for God's plan to work, right? Because the right thing to do is always the right thing before God, right? But one thing is this, true love is also prepared to trust God with the outcome, okay? With the outcome. And we'll see this in Genesis, right? In J chapter 29, because right, Jacob loved Rachel and he was prepared to serve his father-in-law Laban for seven years to win her. Even after he was tricked, he was still prepared to serve another seven years for her. And it seemed like just a few days. Why? Because she was worth it. Just worth it. And by the way, the example left by our Christ our Savior was this. He left his throne, gave up everything to seek after, to pursue his bride on earth, right? Came in the form of man, in the form of a servant, died. Right and okay, endure the agony, all these agonies, in order to win her. Why, to win the bride? Why, because she was worth it. And men, we are told that as husband and wife, it's just like what we are, just like Christ, and then a wife, just like the church. Is she worth it to you? Man, is she worth it to you? Is she worth leaving everything? Even your career prospects. Men? 
even your hobby. Right? The wives mention, you know, sometimes there's too much of preoccupation with their husbands, there's too much preoccupation with their hobbies. Our Lord left everything for the sake of his bride to win her. Okay. One pastor I know, he is today still a missionary and in the ministry because when the time came and there was a decision, a choice, because the wife ran off, he resigned, dropped everything to seek after her, to win her back. And years later, he was able to be in the ministry again and then to be a missionary. Why? Because he did what was necessary. Why? Because she was worth it. She's worth it. Not just for the sake of the ministry, but for the sake of his wife. Okay? You see how in this situation, here is the test of faith now because there is a risk that you will lose what you want if you obey the Lord. Your future happiness is at risk. Do you follow God's plan or you do it your own way? What will you choose? I know it, it seems very obvious in theory, but when it comes to what, the love of your life and your happiness and all that, you know something? Many times we choose a different way. Naomi recognizes this. Boaz is a very persistent man. He, this, he will not be in rest until he has finished the thing this day. And, he, and Naomi tells Ruth, sit. Sit still and wait. Why? Because things have been set in motion. He is not just a patient man. He is a persistent man. He will do whatever it takes to make this happen and to make this right. Okay? And here, I want us to realize there is, it takes wisdom to know the right balance between waiting on the Lord's timing and then moving quickly to action. Now, all this is building up to a very big climax here in chapter, in the, into the next chapter. How will this work out? How is God going to work this out? All right? You and I will have what anxiety over the outcome. Okay, because there is a very real test of faith here because the anxiety is there. What if it doesn't work out the way we want it to work out? What then? And deep down, there is the temptation at this point where, you know what? The danger is this. We, we have this temptation that maybe it's time to kick God out of the throne and to take over because this is a very crucial time. It's a very, very important juncture. And if we don't do something, it may go wrong. And the test is going to be, can I trust that He is still in control? Or that I have to take control? Oh, but uh, Pastor, you don't understand. You know, under this kind of circumstance and, uh, you know, the, 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 the pressure of the situation and all that, um, it's understandable that we'll know you are being pragmatic. Because all, the only difference is this, that the amount of hot water has changed, but it's still revealing the flavor of what's inside the tea bag. You want to be in control. Right? But... If I do it this way, you know, after all that's happened and, you know, I may just lose the most precious person in my life. And the question will be this, are you prepared to accept what is God's plan for you? This afternoon, we had so many questions about, you know, about knowing the will of God and all that now concerning uh, who to marry, whatever. Can, can, do you realize what if the Lord says, you know what? Okay. Whatever and whoever you've been praying for and whatever you have in mind, I'm going to cancel that and I'm going to rewrite and I'm going to put somebody else there. And the question before us will be this, will you accept it? And sadly, I believe the real answer for many will be no. Why? 
Think about this. We, we will come forward in, during the invitation. We will come and say, Lord, whatever you want, I want to know your will. I want to do your will. Okay, fine. Hand out that piece of paper, whatever you've written on there. Will you allow him to cancel that and rewrite something, even if it's the last thing that you want? Are you prepared to? If not, you're not seeking God's will. Okay? I hate to point out the unpleasant truth. You're not really interested in the will of God. You want Him to rubber stamp whatever you have put there. That's all. You just want His approval, alright, so that it will look spiritual in front of everybody else. But listen, if you really seek and you want His plan, His will, His desire for your life, do you realize that what if He's going to tell you for the rest of your life, do not do the thing that you love the most. Will you, are you prepared to do that? I'm going to ask some of the singers here. If His good and perfect will for you will be that the rest of your life you do not sing specials, are you prepared to give that up? Are you? I set that aside for many years. You know, I was asked to sing a special, okay, I was prepared to do it, I can do it. I set that aside for many years, why? Because I wanted to stay focused in preparing for the pastoral ministry. And I did not want to be distracted. But if you love the Lord, then the question is, what if He asks you to give up the one thing that is most, that you treasure the most? Will you do it? Can you? Okay, because before Ruth and Boaz right now, right, in order for this to play out as a happy ending, they're going to have to trust God that things will not fall apart if they commit to God's plan. Okay, because there is a constant de temptation here for us to take control. And so as we wrap up tonight here, I want to end with this thought. What will you, if you were Boaz, if you were Ruth, what will you do? How will you choose? Right? With all the fear, all the anxiety, with all the risk that's involved, are you still prepared to trust God? Or will you go your own way? And maybe for some of us here, you know, on, left to ourselves, we will take things into our own hands. Then let me challenge you. Will you come and acknowledge that before the Lord that this is how I am right now? I confess that. But I want to change that. Lord, I want you to take over. Who tonight will come and say, Lord, whatever you want, I am prepared to come before you with a blank sheet of paper, you write whatever you want there. Lord, I've been coming to you with a piece of paper and there are certain requests that are written there. I come to you now acknowledging that if you want to cancel and rewrite anything there, so be it. Because you are Lord. I acknowledge you as Lord and sovereign over my life and you can do anything you want. All right. Some of you here have been agonizing, okay? You, you're not married yet, you're single. Tonight, the question is no longer whether who should I marry or whatever. Why don't you come tonight and say, Lord, whatever you want to do with me, it's entirely up to you, and I will be content and I'll be satisfied with that. But I am presenting you this blank sheet of paper. You write your plan. I am not coming with any plan anymore. You are boss. You are Lord. You are in charge. You are king. Listen, Boaz and Ruth have every good intention. They want to do what's right. They want to preserve the family name of Malon. Right? They want to, um, not only that, they care for each other. They like each other. But, Nothing is more important than what God wants. Okay? And some of us here, 
need to come tonight before the Lord and just commit everything. With all good intentions, you may be making plans uh, to do something, go somewhere or change, some, go on a very major change in the direction of your life, whoever. But listen, don't you think that what he thinks, right, what the Lord thinks is more important than just our intentions? Because we can get ourselves into very serious trouble with our good intentions. Up to this point, everything that you see in chapter 2 and chapter 3 has been directed by the hand of God one step after another. And notice, God can bring coincidences. God can put the, the puzzle together in small pieces, even if we don't know the overall plan. But you notice, He has orchestrated this. He has brought Boaz and Ruth this far. To the point, both are in agreement, both have a willingness to even be married and spend the rest of their life together, but there is a problem. But you notice, who tonight will come and say, I will wait. Right? I'm going to trust him. I don't know how this is going to work out, but I'm going to trust him to work out the details as to what to do next. Somebody here tonight may be You've been sitting there for some time and it is time to make a move. It's time to do something. Right? No jokes aside. It is time like Boaz, right? You know this Boaz had to make his move and do something. He will go, he's not going to stop until and rest until this is settled. Maybe someone tonight, like Ruth, you need someone to nudge you and then to give somebody a nudge because things are not happening. I don't know. Whatever the situation may be, there are, there are many situations, many scenarios in what, what we covered all right, that I believe can apply to nearly everybody here in this room. All right, as we close here tonight, all right, I want to challenge everyone where is your heart today? Okay? Because I cannot see what's in your heart. I don't know. But the Lord does. And in this time of invitation and prayer, this is now between you and the Lord. It's the moment of decision. It's time to make your move. What will you do? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. For even through this text and this lesson, Lord, I pray that you will help us in this time of prayer to come and do serious business with you. That we will commit our way unto thee and that you will just have mercy on us in grace. Help us, Lord, as we endeavor to do the right thing. I pray and ask right now that you give us courage, boldness in the spirit, and then Lord, humility or so, that we commit our way to thee, forsaking our own way, forsaking our, the temptation that, to take things into our own hands. I pray for one here who has decisions to make. And Lord, you know the many temptations that lie before us. But help us to realize there can be only one Lord and one King sitting on the throne in our lives. And we have to settle who that is today. Whether it's ourselves or you, Lord. So Lord, I pray that you help us to come boldly before the throne of grace. And then to commit our way to you. Lord, give us grace. Give us wisdom to discern and to that we may be directed by you. And then, Lord, make our way clear and light our path. For this, we ask in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pastor.